part two, part two of today's program. Uh, part two uh, kicks off with a, a very simple uh, but pertinent question. What measures can investors and companies employ to promote women's leadership? What measures can investors and companies employ to promote uh, w women's leadership? And now our, our next speaker is an expert on this very subject. Uh, she studied the barriers to gender inclusion in the workplaces and interviewed dozens, maybe hundreds of, I guess, mostly male CEOs and uh, executives to understand uh, Moore's attitudes and views uh, from the Center for Research on Gender Equality. Please welcome Marie Teagan. I, I'm going to click myself, or? No, you just gesture to the... the, the okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I'm going to, uh, I, I think, give kind of a reflection about uh, gender equality uh, measures. Uh, but I will, I will start to say a few words about... Uh, I mean, the Nordic countries are well known for their success in gender equality, and we know that from a lot of different indexes where the Nordic countries are uh, on the on the top. Uh, on, but especially, but it's it is concerns in a particular uh, women's access to the labor market and education. But as we already talked about today, not so much in reaching the top positions, and especially not in, in business life. So here are the slides. As you can see, it's actually male dominance uh, in all types of sectors, uh, but, but in the parliament, it's, uh, it's um, almost equal. And in, in the, can you go back to the uh, previous slide? Uh, but you see that it, it gets more and more uh, male-dominated as you move towards uh, the biggest uh, companies in Norwegian business life. Uh, so there's 20% uh, women in top management groups of the 200 biggest companies, and there's uh, 8 or 7.5% uh, women in uh, CEOs of the 200 biggest companies. Uh, and, and then, uh, as we already also have talked about today, uh, Norway, the gender uh, equality country, uh, is not so different when it, uh, from other, other places when it comes to the top positions. So these are the numbers for the 200 biggest uh, Norwegian and U.S. Uh, companies, and of course many of the biggest uh, U.S. companies are much bigger than, than the Norwegian ones, uh, but, but still, this gives an indication of the situation on, on the top. So then, uh, let's talk a little bit about what has been the typical Norway solution to the problem. And we have actually already talked about that today, too, about the gender quotas for corporate boards. Norway introduced regulations of gender balance for corporate boards in 2003. Uh, these regulations include public limited companies, which is mostly the stock listed companies, uh, and publicly owned companies and corporate companies. And uh, since it was mentioned the problems in Kenya to, to uh, uh, implement uh, gender quota procedures, there's actually quite tough sanctions in Norway. Uh, the legislation is part of the company legislation, and it says after inquiries, if you don't fulfill the gender quota, uh, fees can be... be um, uh, oh, sorry, that's wrong word. But, but then, uh, final dissolution is in fact the tough sanction in the end. Uh, this has never been 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 used, uh, but it says something about uh, how seriously uh, this uh, regulation is meant. So, why did Norway introduce uh, gender quotas for corporate boards? 
First, and that is very important to mention, it was introduced to change the male dominance in corporate boards. It was about 6% uh, women in uh, the stock-listed company boards at the time when, when the regulation was uh, pl uh, under plan. Uh, and, and it also, and, and at least here is where, where we have had a lot of the dis debate around the quota legislation to facilitate ripple effects from corporate boards to executive management. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what happened. Uh, here you can see the situation in uh, the representation of women in in uh, in uh, in, uh, in uh, the boards of the publicly limited companies, and as you can see, it it uh, it raised quite uh, fast. Uh, and in comparison, uh, the blue line is the situation in in the in the corporate boards not. Uh, not affected by legislation. So, so clearly, uh, the legislation had effect on the gender composition in the boards affected by uh, regulation. <clears throat> but then, for boards, in other words, great success, but not for top management positions. Uh, we can see here, these are numbers from the 200 biggest uh, companies. Boards affected by regulations are gender balanced. Boards not affected by regulations are not gender balanced. Top management is dominated by men, whether or not uh, corporate boards is gender balanced. So that's the situation we are in today. So why no ripple effects? One reason, I think, has to do that that we're still in a situation where there's a missing link between the boards and the top management. How actively are the boards pushing for changes in the recruitment policies of the companies? And then there's another type of question, and that is uh, has to do with um, the problems with uh, imposing solutions that do not promote engagement and motivations uh, within the company. Uh, and maybe even uh, regulations that uh, produce uh, resistance. Um, so so th therefore, I will, I will end this uh, presentation by saying a little bit about what our senior managers' views on barriers to gender balance. What kind of measures do senior uh, managers think would be a good idea to make changes happen when it comes to gender balance in, in top management? So here's the question about what do business life top managers think will work? They are very much uh, in, in agree that active recruitment policies are what is needed. We need active recruitment policies for the top management level and we need active recruitment policies uh, for the middle management level and we need uh, to raise women's awareness about uh, uh, career opportunities. That this is what they uh, agree on. We see generally that there's a, a small gender difference, and that is because on all the questions we have asked the managers of the biggest Norwegian companies about, women are more enthusiastically for uh, gender equality uh, questions. But there's one difference here. And that is leadership programs for women. Men are more in favor of leadership programs for women. And I think that it is time for us to think a little bit more about why, are, uh, why do we find this gender difference exactly on this. Uh, okay, uh, so then I will just, before I come to my final conclusion, just some main findings. 
top positions in business life as male dominated in Norway as elsewhere. Corporate board quotas has changed to gender uh, composition of boards, but not top management. Top managers are supportive of gender balanced policies. That's important to keep in mind. Top, man top managers most, uh, most engaged with uh, active recruitment uh, policies and mo most in, I think we have to think about uh, where they feel their field of discretions are. And women generally more in, in support. Uh, and then the conclusion. Maybe companies and social partners need to take the lack of support for leadership programs for women among women into consideration. I, I, I think that, I think it's uh, fantastic what NHO has done with Female Future Program. And I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing for uh, that we should get rid of that kind of, of uh, programs. But when we look at what kind of measures companies are, are using uh, um, to get more gender balance within the companies, uh, there's at least a, a predominance of, uh, of uh, measures that uh, are, are directed at the women, uh, at their networks, uh, at their leadership uh, capabilities and, and things like that. And I think actually it's, it's, it's high time that business life think more about their own internal recruitment policies, their own career, career advancement uh, systems and so on, if we really are hoping for a change uh, within uh, this field. Thank you. Thank you, Marie Teagan there from the Center for Research on Gender Equality. Very interesting uh, presentation there. Now, um, let's hear from the pure private sector and three leading companies that pride themselves on tackling gender diversity head on. Uh, from Start Oil, we have Anna Prater Fonseca Nordang. Uh, please join us on the red couch. Um, Probably, actually, you two of you could sit on the couch and then one on the green chair. So take the green chair now, whilst you have the chance. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, uh, Anna Prater Fonseca Nordang. Anna is the, the head of executive and leadership development at Start Oil. Um, joining her, representing IKEA, or I've been in Norway long enough to say IKEA. Uh, is Pia Valla. Uh, Pia is also the manager of leadership development at IKEA Diversity and Inclusion. Please join us, uh, Pia. And uh, to make up uh, my trio, uh, Fatima Sani. Uh, Fatima is the regional sales manager for Google Analytics. Give them a round of applause. They're your next panel. Okay, really Simple but important question, really softball I'm going to throw at you first, and I think I'm going to start with Anna. And that question is, just take two minutes or so to explain uh, your unique or specific approach to promoting women, promoting measures, promoting strategies that will create leaders, women leaders, in your own company and create a better gender balance. Okay, so you want me to address that in two minutes? In two minutes, <laughs> okay, I said. Fantastic. No pressure. <laughs> Let me see what I can do in two minutes. So uh, my name is Anna Nordang. Thank you for having me here today. I'm uh, representing Statoil. Uh, we're a global energy company, as I think many of you know, of course. Um, diversity and start all. In start all, we believe that uh, difference in perspectives, uh, differences in background, and diversity and inclusion are going to be key to our business success and our, to, to our long-term development. So when, I, when we talk about diversity, and I know that today we're talking about gender, for start all, diversity is about gender and more. It's about differences in perspective. It's about multi-generational groups, differences in background and gender. So all of those elements combined, if we can create a work environment where, where that diversity of background, diversity of experience, diversity of gender, where those can thrive, then we believe that we will contribute as a company to society and we will be sustainable from a long-term perspective. Two minutes. Impressive. 
Tried. Thank you. <laughs> Here, the pressure is on. Oh, okay, yeah. your approach. It's really hard. Okay, hi, I'm uh, Pia Walla. I work at uh, IKEA Norway. Um, IKEA is a global company. Uh, most of us know IKEA here in Norway is retail, but IKEA is actually much more than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, in IKEA Global, we are 165,000 employees working for IKEA. It's a small nation. It's a small nation, <laughs> actually. So, so it's uh, diversity and inclusion is a very, very important part for us of, of our uh, business. And uh, here in uh, Norway, we uh, have uh, seven stores. And in these seven stores, we have really, really a diverse group working for us. And it's very important of all kind of diversity into our business. And when we work with the women, we really also work with the, the immigrant women coming to Norway that want to have a job. And for us, it's really important for those women also to have a voice, not only to be as an employer in our company. Uh, we would like them to also to grow, and we would like them to see that they have a career, and we would like to support them in that. Mm. And that is... Um, mm, it's, uh, and, and you've got, at IKEA, you've got this... Uh, six-step model, haven't you, that yeah. is your starting point, I guess, yes. for how you approach this. Tell us about that. Yes. We have a six-step six model, and uh, the first step in that model for us, it's really important that we have the mindset, that we really have the competence in the diversity we work with, and, uh, and that uh, we have the mindset when we start working with that, that. And of course, then to analyze the situation in the market, or in the store, or in the department, uh, where we are working and then again to put uh, activities onto the goals that we are setting that we really have the right activities and then that we work with the inclusive systems like systems which are mentioned here today with the recruitment with the leadership programs with the, we work with the succession we have a goal of recruiting 70 percent of our leaders from internal ikea mm. and really have systems that uh, support that the, and then of course uh, afterward that we measure and follow up on the goals that we have been setting mm. so that is really a sustainable mm change that we are doing. Mm. Okay, let me move on. I IKEA is a cool company, mm. but Google's a cool company too. <laughs> yes. Google Analytics. And also the, the interesting thing uh, about it, Fatima, is that you're in technology. You're in the digital space, mm. you know, where the, the change happens daily. Yeah. You know, it's such a new, fresh, exciting space for young people. Uh, being Africans, both of us, you know, the, it's the youngest continent in the world. And there's a huge number of young women there. And this is a chance. Technology offers the, affords us an opportunity to balance things a little bit. Google has a, job, a role to play in that because it's arguably the biggest the biggest new technology brand. Mm. So you're sitting right in the middle of that. So I want to know what your thoughts are and what you're doing. And that introduction gives me no pressure. <laughs> so I, I would like to extend and say thank you for the invitation of being here today. So I uh, represent a department at Google that deals with analytics. And that alone is normally an extremely male-dominated environment. So I'm breaking a bit of a stereotype by entering that space. And I lead the team here in the Nordics. Um, in terms of the company, I think you touched on a lot of these points. We've been at the forefront of so much transformation, both technology in terms of infrastructure Structure and also in terms of the devices that we are using uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So at the very early stage of my time at Google, which is now running up to nine years, we've identified that diversity is actually essential for us to stay connected to the customers that we're trying to service. So I think keeping that kind of mindset has really enabled us to be a bit agile and actually use the connections and the understanding that we have of our existing employees to actually develop solutions internally that help us to better recruit and actually identify talent in the market. It is not easy. It's mm. extremely challenging. We are operating uh, all over the world. I actually lost count of the number of countries in which we are present. And that actually intensifies our fragility in terms of not doing it right. So one of the things that we're really proud of is actually developing internal communities where employees from different diversity representations, and I very much aligned with what Statel was just saying in terms of it's not just about gender, it's not just about nationality or ethnicity, it's really around all 
the different elements that make employees unique and how can we as a company understand uh, what those elements actually are and then grow and, and, and create environments where employees can be themselves and ultimately also attract employees from, civil, from similar diversity stances. Um, like in terms of the, our, our, our strategy, besides investing on these internal communities, we also have been very present in creating um, investment in scholarship developments mm. and also in external programs that allow you know, people to actually understand what Google does. We are such a complicated and complex company that sometimes women wouldn't apply because they don't understand exactly what they could do at Google. So we try to really create that barrier and be a bit more human in our approach and actually breaking these barriers of concepts of women should not be working in Google. And that brings, I, I covered Silicon Valley during the dot-com boom for MSNBC as a technology journalist when, old, when Google was still in, I used to interview them when they were still in the garage. Um, uh, and, um, you know, there were a lot of myths around back then. Uh, what do they call myths in Norwegian? Mita. Yeah. Is it Mita? Mita? How's my pronunciation? <laughs> anyway, a lot of myths. And, and those myths were not just perpetuated by, by, by men. Women, too, bought into these myths. Mm -hmm. One of the big ones is women were no good at technology. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and these things, these myths are stereotypes that grow and grow and grow around women, not just technology, but in many fields. Yeah? Most are fabricated nonsense. We can agree on that, right? Yes? Mm -hmm. Do... do is the first step that women have to consciously stop believing in those myths themselves. Absolutely. I feel that we should be, we as professionals, not just women in general, we should be more focused on understanding what value we bring to the discussion, mm. whether or not that value is expected and whether or not we represent the most common person that brings that value and actually think more about the core of what we are doing in the organization and, and try not to be maybe demotivated by what we find. I think it's sometimes uh, a case of being comfortable with not having uh, maybe a popular voice or a popular stand in a discussion and then use that representation and that strength to actually open up the door for other women to be part of it. Mm -hmm. I've joined this industry before we had Android. So it's actually a relatively miles of, of years ago. And I think since then, I'm really happy to see that there are definitely more women taking uh, such roles. And I think also companies in our industry have become less cynical to the fact that um, even though we do have maybe different uh, approaches to career development and different approaches to what it means to be successful, companies are recognizing that and giving us the room to be leaders in our own voice. Mm -hmm. So I do feel that uh, that stigma is still there, mm -hmm. lightly, but I feel that there's a, a better platform for women to just be who they are and actually be valued for the actual competences that they bring into the workplace. That's digital technology, male dominated yeah. uh, to a great degree, but even more so oil and gas, mm -hmm. isn't it? Oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And so from Statoil being one of, uh, well, Norway's biggest oil company, um, I saw you nodding your head in agreement. What, what, where, what is she saying that seems to dovetail into what you see? So a couple of elements. Uh, first, we're also a very cool company. <laughs> Sorry, you are at all. Uh, we're extremely if, 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 cool company. It's being streamed live, apparently, and my in-laws are watching. Offshore wind. Fat oil is cool. Offshore wind, <laughs> remote record. automation. We are a super cool technology <laughs> company, first of all. Uh, second, I think what I was uh, uh, when Fatima was talking, I was really thinking about the importance of role models, female mm, role Yeah, models. mentors. Mm -hmm. Mentors. Mentors and sponsors. And so I think what we've tried to do in Statoil, you know, when you look at, we don't have enough women in leadership positions. I'll just mm. be very blunt in saying that. We have about 30% in leadership positions, which is better mm. than most oil and gas companies, but it's not good enough. Mm. But we do have our, you know, our head of uh, most senior executive leader of technology and projects is a woman. Our head of our new energy business is a woman. Our chief operating officer is a woman. And that, I think, creates uh, role models for the rest of the organization creates inspiration and helps to open up those doors. Mm. But that's not enough. I think part of the challenges that we face as technology companies and across other industries is actually attracting from an early career, from young age actually, at the high school level, at the middle school mm. level, already encouraging girls to think that technology is cool. Mm. It's good to play with things. It's, it's, it's cool to try to make things 
create things. And I think we actually need to do a much better job already starting at the educational level system. And that's why we're such a big proponent and supporter of STEM studies, actually encouraging girls to think about technology. Mm. And then we need to, you know, we need to encourage them to join. We need to create interesting jobs, think about automation technology as cool jobs. And then internally, I think we have a lot of work to do. And I was talking to P about some of the biases that we have. Mm. We recruit people that look like us, yes. mm. that have the, the same reminders of ourselves mm. as us, that went to mm. the same school. Mm. You know, if I see someone from Portugal, if I see someone who also lived in the U.S., I, you know, I strike up a conversation. So we need to remove some of the mm. biases in terms of who we're looking, how we're looking at them, and then how we're promoting them within uh, the organization. And around the world, what you've just uh, touched on is really important because it impacts what companies consider to be diversity. Mm -hmm. Often they have diversity manifestos, mm -hmm. but they're not uh, based on, on, on gender or, or race. They're based on background and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that ticks that box and then their job is done. So the, it, the status quo remains because of the way companies consider the term diversity and what it means. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that brings me to the question, what does diversity really mean to you? I know that uh, in IKEA, for example, you, you've got a little bit of a head start over a lot of companies because of the, uh, because of the, I guess the culture I would call it of the founder, um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, was was mm, was almost so much f f further thinking mm. uh, ahead than his peers yeah. at that time. And that culture, you've sort of held on to that 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 flame, so to speak, and Absolutely. you guard it yes. and you grow it. Yes. So tell us about Absolutely. that. Absolutely, it's it's really a value-based culture mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. our founder started, and you know he wrote his uh, testament. Uh, furniture dealers' testaments on the 70s because uh, he, should, he wanted to be sure that IKEA is really the IKEA that he started when he's getting older. And now he's 92 and his sons are taking over and we have kind of refreshed our values a little bit, but they are still the same. And being a value-based company, that is really, really important for us and living the values and the values are, are alive in our company. Let's, let's, talk, let's talk, I know that you all work for very, very big companies, but I've got you here now, so I just want to know your opinion on this. Um, I was looking at the figures in the US, and we saw some of the figures there, uh, some 9 million US firms owned by women. Uh, there, there are still too few female investors, and I remember, I remember seeing this. I cannot remember a female investor in technology in Silicon Valley 20 years ago when I was covering uh, the dot-com era. I don't think things have massively changed then maybe they they have but that impacts startup entrepreneurs because the people giving out the money they're giving you that first break mm -hmm. are dudes mm -hmm. they're guys right so that needs to change uh, that can make it really really challenging for raising capital if you have a great idea and even finding mentors because it's not just about money it's also about the knowledge from above money comes often with capacity and support so uh, what are some of the the things that you've come across that could change that dynamic uh, i don't know fatima yeah, absolutely. I spent some time uh, living and working in Southeast Asia, uh, and that for me was an eye-opener, where, for example, Indonesia is one of the countries that has the largest number of female CEOs, mm. and you would never expect it because there's a cultural uh, contrast right away. Um, and I feel that one of the strategies that emerging markets have actually utilized was to build these networks where women could actually learn from other women outside of their typical industry or their typical career backgrounds, where you can actually start understanding that to become a leader, you don't necessarily have to follow a very particular path, or you don't have to have a particular background in order to achieve that. And I also value the fact that our company, so Google has invested a lot in tech hubs, where we try to actually recruit women to be part of the leadership and the advisory board of these tech hubs, which gives us a bit more agility in terms of reaching out to grassroots organizations and also going into universities and actually addressing the, the issue from the core. So I think that maintaining a certain flexibility uh, on how we engage with women, uh, not only for them to become investors, because I guess that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have succeeded in becoming uh, inclusive, but I think it's more motivating them to be part of the discussion at any role or any capacity, as long as they're able to display that leadership. So I think that those two areas, 
possibly resume some of the good examples that I've seen. Yeah. Uh, and mm. one thing that was mentioned up there that uh, I, this is a, per a perfect for, uh, for it, a perfect panel, yeah. was uh, what we will never call the work-life balance again. Mm. The, the, you know, the, the family dynamics and, and, and how to deal with that. The goal of, uh, it, it, that balance is the goal of any entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur myself and I tackle it mm. and struggle with it now and again mm. uh, and uh, as a man. But it's even more so when you're a, a mother who starts a business mm. and has to simultaneously often run the family uh, and the company. Yeah? In this area, there's so many traditional gender expectations. They prevail, don't they? Mm. So from that perspective, um, not just, I'm not just talking about starting a business. I'm starting rising up in a business in Google, uh, in Statoil, mm. uh, in I I IKEA. Mm. Um, what do you, what's your advice right there in terms of that balance? Perhaps, uh, Pia, you want, to, you want to start? Yeah, I, I think really uh, work with the family policy is uh, really important for us. And, and it, it's different in different markets. Mm -hmm. But uh, as we see, uh, for example, in uh, IKEA in Japan, supporting women when they have get the child to come back to work again with uh, having child care systems and also allowing uh, women who are leaders to have part-time jobs mm -hmm. so that in a period you can uh, share a job, store manage a job with another person so that you really can... Mm, also take care of a family. Fatima. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think at Google what we've been trying to do is actually open up the discussion. Sometimes it's a taboo when uh, women or men actually go away to be with their kids and be on parental leave. It's normally a topic of discussion that doesn't uh, maybe get exposed to other people who don't have kids, who sometimes are the ones who are quite skeptical about the return. So we have made a, a very conscious effort to make these topics known to everyone so that everyone understands how challenging it can be and the role that we can play in actually supporting our peers and supporting our teams in returning back to work. Um, another area is that we have announced early this year that we have uh, actually made it mandatory for men to take at least three months of parental leave regardless of the country and location where they are which is a, a huge message mm. in terms of trying to make this, this conversation a bit more balanced we also have some some programs where we try to enable actually mothers to bring their kids to work and we have playground I mean our office is a playground so as you <laughs> if you see Google is a playground <laughs> exactly. so actually have rooms where kids can actually come and spend and half the day in the office to make it easier for their mothers to attend a meeting or be part of the, the work discussion. Mm. Um, we do have a relatively open environment, but there's still some work that we can do to, mm. to alleviate some of the pressures. Yeah. I just want to add, I think, one perspective uh, to, to the comments so far. I think one of the elements where we need to work even harder is actually not making assumptions mm. uh, for women and not avoiding asking the question of women. You know, we have very generous maternity and paternity leave benefits in Norway. Mm. Um, it's very easy for a woman in Norway to work 8 to 4 or 8 to 4.30. After that, 4.30 becomes much more difficult to juggle the rest of it. Mm. I think one of the challenges we face sometimes is that we make assumptions that women with young kids, oh, let's not put her in that position. Let's not ask Anna if she wants to take on this assignment or if she wants to take on that position. She just came back from work. She just had another kid. Well, let let women make the choices, mm. enable them and put them in a position where they can actually make the choices and have a conversation and allow them to have actually a voice. I think that's part of the challenge. And, you know, it's, it's, we have come so much forward, actually, in terms of our maternity and parental live benefits, and especially mm. in Norway. But I think we still have a lot of biases and a lot of assumptions that hold us back. Uh, and we don't mean to do that. It's very, it's very unconscious the way we do it, but mm. it, 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 we need to overcome that, actually. Do we? Do you agree? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes uh, it, it goes two ways. I think it goes from management assuming that, oh, they will probably not really welcome a challenge right now because, you know, they're just coming back. But sometimes even ourselves, we say, well, I have these plans mm. in my personal life and therefore I will not push really hard because mm. I may not be able to deliver true. Mm. And I think we have to be more compartmentalized in our thinking mm. when it comes to the moment. So as long as you can deliver today to the maximum, you should take that opportunity. Mm. And I think when it comes... It. Exactly. Mm. And when it comes to the time that you have to go, 
companies have mechanisms to help yes. you hand over, involve yeah. others, well, hire people we to replace you. And borrow that. trouble from the future that doesn't exist anyway. Or we put yeah. barriers ourselves, yeah. I yeah, think. Exactly. I think sometimes mm. we put barriers ourselves and mm. companies can be much more flexible mm. if we're just engaging in that conversation. Uh, uh, and one, sorry, you want to? Yeah, yeah, I just want to say also that we should uh, encourage the men more to take the paternity mm. leave, mm. also to support them, because we see that men really want to take that leave. Mm. But then you are in positions that you feel that you can no. do it mm. because of the business. Mm. It's a good point, mm. looking at it from the other angle. Uh, yeah, one I may just add one curious uh, story. Uh, the next time that you hear that a man is going to become a father, really congratulate him yes. and really make him feel this is great. Because normally men don't not naturally share that they're about to become fathers until maybe one or two months before, which for me is extremely strange. So I've had situations in my team where they announce, oh, I'm going to have a baby. So next month, you know, I'm taking, I make a big fuss of it. I make Almost make as an apology. <laughs> exactly. I'm sorry, I'm going to have a baby. <laughs> you know. and, and I think it's really, men should also be celebrated yes. about becoming parents and I think that also helps equalizing the discussion so they know that you know it's great that they're going away it's great that they're focusing on their family and mm. you know it's the same thing with, with women so I think we should be a bit mm. more normal that uh, seems to be a red thread that's running through the day that the mm. conversation needs to be broadened and we need to we're too too often we're focusing on what women, women should do what women want what they need to change the the thing but we really will never do this unless we start to become more inclusive in the conversation in and that's one perfect way uh, uh, another red thread that runs through today is the concept of making the case, the economic case mm -hmm. for women in leadership. And I, I read something really uh, interesting here. Uh, one of the articles I read said that um, it was a re research that was done on this uh, same subject. And it said directors that they were interviewed believed that women were more likely than men to thoroughly deliberate and evaluate risks mm -hmm. in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. Women, in their view, showed a greater propensity to monitor firm management. Many directors thought that women's status as outsiders, to some degree, to the corporate boardroom, yes, constituted, contributed to their independent thinking. Mm -hmm. That's what the article said. What do you think? When was the article written? Uh, 1842. <laughs> 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 yeah, maybe, maybe it was in reference to the you know, 19th century, I no, guess. No, but it just, it, it, there is no doubt <laughs> yeah. about it that if yeah. you change the dynamic of a boardroom, yes. you yeah. change the boardroom. Absolutely. Yes. Straight immediately. Yeah. You change the quality of the conversation, you change the, the, very, you change the brain effectively. Mm. And, and that's uh, quite exciting. And when, when we're talking about making the case, mm. isn't that making the case effectively mm. for how more efficient? I mean, how do you, when you, when you, the three of you, mm. how do you make the case for more women? I mean, what do you, what are the benefits when you're telling people who need to be enlightened, what do you say to them? Um, I, I usually say more diversity, build diverse teams around you. And that includes more women, but it also includes people with a different background, with a different perspective, because it's the richness of experience and background that is going to make that conversation a better conversation. And that company a better company. And that's going to make the decision a better decision, a better investment. But it's, um, it's about the balance, right? You want balance of gender, you want balance of groups of different age groups. You now have people working until the age of 70, and you've got the millennials coming up. How do you get the best out of that blend? How do you get the best of people that come from very different backgrounds? Mm. So it's not so much about the gender, although this is the discussion today, and that is a very important starting point. Mm. But it's about diversity and richness of experience, background, and perspective. Mm. If you get three different perspectives, you're going to come to a better decision. Yes. There's no question about it. Mm. Fatima, Pia, it's the blend. She's saying it's the blend. <laughs> it's definitely the blend. Yeah, I think it, absolutely. I think it's uh, to some degree. It's also looking at the society and try to ensure that as a manager, you are also building a team that represents the needs for that society. Yeah. And, and not do it so so much in isolation that mm. you want the best team. But I think mm -hmm. your team has to be meaningful mm. to the stakeholders that you are engaging with. Yes, good point. So I think really broadening hiring to a, a, a bigger question. You know? oh, yeah. Pia, you can have the final word. 
Yeah, well, I, I must say that uh, at IKEA in Norway, we are quite uh, proud because we have 55% women in our leadership positions and we are 380 leaders at IKEA. But when we dig into it and when we look where do women lead and where do men lead, we see that we are very traditional. Mm. We see that men lead in logistics, women lead in interior design and in HR and in sales. So we also need to look into where do women lead and that we are diverse also in the different um, positions in the company. Mm. And, and we saw some sobering statistics up there mm. from mm. Two, pre two, two uh, or three uh, presenters um, that, that showed us stuff that really, you can see the, the magnitude of the job ahead, but, and you don't know what's ahead. So with that misty optic, mm. are you optimistic about women, that things will change quickly? Uh, cautiously optimistic. Uh, cautiously. It's, yeah. You know, it's we've been making a, in Stadol, we've been making progress, but we've you know we've hit that 30% mark, mm. and now we're trying to to break through in a way. To break through. Mm. Um, you know, we have quotas in our board. Our board is very engaged in the topic of diversity, in the topic of gender, leadership development. I mean, they're passionate about it. Uh, male and female board members. Uh, but it's it's a question of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. It's a question of the pipeline. It's a question of uh, perceptions, uh, beliefs, and also our biases. And that takes time to change. Mm. That takes a lot of time to change. But I am cautiously optimistic that I think in five years' time, in ten years' time, we're going to have more female CEOs in Norway mm. uh, and in other European countries, and that we'll see more diverse leadership teams across from your mouth to God's ears. Ladies, stand, please so. rise and acknowledge the applause for a great panel. Now, if I could ask you to take your seats. Uh, one of the keys to the success of this agenda for gender, diversity, uh, is to build the right collaborations and partnerships. You can't do it alone. It's about putting people together, uh, as, as we've heard. Uh, we have two great speakers uh, on that. The first has come all the way from uh, Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, she's the president, CEO, and co-founder of We Connect International, a corporate-led non-profit that helps empower women business owners to succeed in those global markets. Please welcome Elizabeth Vasquez. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Friends, new friends. This is my first time in Oslo, so I am really excited. It is beautiful. Uh, it, yeah, you deserve it. It's it's gorgeous and it's very inspiring. Uh, the people I have met have been very welcoming, and uh, I think we have a lot to learn from you. Um, for those of us based in the United States and in many other countries, so thank you for your leadership in this space of being more inclusive and giving everyone an equal opportunity to reach their full potential. And that's really what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, is this concept of being inclusive. Um, no, it's not just about gender, but uh, that's one aspect of uh, creating a more inclusive environment. So I want to thank CARE um, for your leadership in bringing us all together. Um, of course, NORFUND and uh, NIHO, it takes collaborations uh, to, to change the world, and that's what we're doing. So just to get a baseline, I'm curious to know, how many of you are uh, business owners? Okay, that is an awesome, that is great. Okay, how many of you support uh, business owners, especially women-owned businesses? Okay, so the rest, almost the rest of you. Okay, so that's good. So this is a, a very friendly audience, um, and already you know a lot about what I'm going to share with you. Um, how many of you in the last week have consciously made um, a purchase from a woman-owned business on a product or a service. That's actually um, an unusually high number. That was about a third of you. That's higher than, than for most countries that I, that I get to visit, even those that are experts in this space. Um, and how many of it, you have heard of this concept of supplier diversity or inclusive sourcing? 
again, pretty high. That's impressive. It's about a fourth of you. Okay, so what I wanted to do is share with you the experience that I've had working with a network that was created. It started in the United States um, where there were a lot of corporations. I think there's a slide on it. Um, some of the world's largest corporations wanting to source from women-owned businesses based in the United States. And they got together and they said, well, if it's good business to buy from women here in the U.S., why wouldn't we do this everywhere? And so these companies got together and they said, well, there's no database of women-owned businesses, um, but we should create one. So they came together and they created We Connect International in 2009. And they said, your mandate is to work with the public sector, private sector, civil society, everyone and anyone who is working with women-owned businesses. You partner with them, you find those women-owned businesses, get them self-registered into a database, certify that they are, in fact, um, women-owned businesses, and develop their capacity to compete in value chains, to win our business, and then introduce these suppliers to our buyers. So we started in uh, the UK, then Canada, India, China, all over Latin America, other parts of the um, Middle East and Asia, um, uh, South Africa, Nigeria, and now several countries in, in Europe. And so we have local representatives in over 20 countries, and we're serving women-owned businesses in over 100 countries. So that means when buyers go into this database, the corporations that you see here go into this database, they can can find products and services offered by women-owned businesses in 100 countries. So the excuse of, well, we would certainly be more inclusive in our sourcing practices if only there were women who could supply us. The challenge, of course, is that, yes, there are women-owned businesses in all sectors, in all countries, and of all sizes. It's just that they're not trying to knock on the doors of large corporations or of governments. And when they do try to knock on the door, they don't necessarily have the right knowledge or the right networks. Very few of them know actual procurement executives um, that source the types of products and services they offer. So while these are some of the best of the best in the world that are consciously going out there trying desperately to find women suppliers, these companies spend over, does anyone, a trillion dollars a year on products and services. Does anyone know how much of that spend is with women-owned businesses? Take a guess. Five, four, one, try one, one percent. Women make a, up a third of private businesses. Half the population, they make over 80% of the purchasing decisions in the world, and they represent 1% of the suppliers to the largest organizations in the world. So while women's entrepreneurship may not change uh, the face of poverty, I can promise you that if we don't get this right, we will not achieve the SDGs, especially SDG 5 on women's empowerment and women's equality. Entrepreneurship, in my experience and working with entrepreneurs over the last 20 years in over 100 countries, um, what they need, what we give them in the development community, we give them a lot of training, we give them access to finance, um, some technology, that's all fantastic. But what entrepreneurs want most is to sell their stuff. But they don't know the buyers and they don't frankly understand what it is the world buys, right? It's a $78 trillion global economy. There's lots and lots of money out there for products and services that are adding value. Women are invisible in that global value chain. We tend to not own assets. And so to build a business, to start and grow a business in an asset-based lending environment where we generally don't own assets is a huge challenge. So we do need to work together with those working in access to finance and providing training and capacity development using technology because you cannot be a supplier to these companies and not have a good technical infrastructure to be able to do um, invoicing at a minimum um, and to understand how to engage with those companies. So the potential is huge, right? So just with these companies alone, a trillion dollars in purchasing power, 1%. To about 10 billion US dollars. But if we were all to work together more effectively, more efficiently, and be more conscious of our purchasing power and how to leverage that purchasing power, we're talking about doubling it, 
woo, 1% to 2%, but that's $10 billion. We have to find women who can supply $10 billion worth of products and services over the next couple of years. And that just gets us to 2%. But the exciting part of getting from 1% to 2% is having companies and governments aware of the importance of being inclusive in their purchasing. And, and I can tell you that while it has huge social impact because of the way women spend their money on their companies, on their families, on their communities, the economic impact is desperately needed. SMEs are the engine of growth in every country I go to. We need women to grow companies. It is not enough for them to simply have a company. Most of them are in the informal sector and they're sole proprietors. We need to give them a good economic reason to move into the formal sector and to start creating much needed quality jobs. And so my, my ask of all of you, because um, Anders emphasized the, the call to action, um, is that you're more conscious after today of your own purchasing power, your consumer purchasing power. You're more conscious of your power within your organization to think beyond HR, really important. We need women on boards. We need women in management, women in leadership. But beyond the internal running of the organization, we have to think about how we spend our money because how we spend our money is literally a vote for the world that we want. It's what we care about. It's what we prioritize. So if you care about women's economic empowerment or inclusion, I don't care if you're spending your money on women-owned businesses or ethnically diverse businesses, people with disabilities, LGBT members of our community, it's being conscious of those communities that we care about and that we need to ensure their success because we all succeed when those communities succeed. And we are a part of those communities. So it's an exciting time to be a woman. It's an exciting time to be a man, to do this with women, to do this together. Or no way do we achieve this if we keep talking to ourselves as women. But it's a time to, in a very short period, change the way we engage with each other. And leveraging purchasing power is a very fundamental way of having a significant impact in our lifetime. So thank you for including me. There's a lot more to talk about because organizations like CARE can do so much to work with, as you saw, the private sector leadership in this space, um, but also the public sector leadership. The governments have their own purchasing power. And very rarely, very rarely is that going to women-owned businesses. Um, so uh, thank you, and I look forward to continuing to learn with all of you for the rest of the day. Thank you, Elizabeth, thank you. Uh, now, every year, the Development Investment Fund Responsibility, you notice I said responsibility, not ability, uh, responsibility deploys $1.2 billion on 500 impact deals around the world in places like Africa. Um, it means they've got a rather unique perspective from the ground on women and entrepreneurship and the transformative effects uh, of that. Uh, responsibility Board Member Christian Thomason uh, has come to tell you more. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for this opportunity to share some perspectives on, uh, on uh, women and entrepreneurship leadership from the lenses of a global development investor. We are fundamentally passionate about development. So let's see how that translates into f uh, female leadership. Um, if we start talking about the sustainable development goals, we have looked at the numbers and uh, they are quite big. In order to achieve them, we need to raise $1.4 trillion per year. That sounds like a big number. But the truth is, it's less than 1% of global GDP. So frankly, if we all chip in, it's actually achievable. However, due partly to, to, due partly to the success, among others, of the microfinance industry in, in achieving the MDGs, for the first time, global common goals now have explicitly included the role of the private sector in achieving them. So to make a long story short, in order to achieve these targets, we need to raise $600 billion a year from the private sector. 
we are one of those players. As you know, most of the SDGs is very much about the South. And our company is passionate about one big thesis. Um, all traditional capital going to the common good is philanthropic in nature. Government philanthropy here in Norway, we are correctly very proud of our big and impressive uh, bistands budget. Um, and this is still uh, both public and private philanthropy will remain very important, and I'll show uh, how and when uh, this works in the future. However, among the many complexities and disadvantages with philanthropic capital is that it does not scale. It is not sufficient philanthropic capital to solve the global sustainability challenges. The only kind of capital that there is affluent, uh, 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 affluence of is private profitable capital. So what we are passionate about is to introducing a new model for sustainability. We would like to prove a thesis that by investing in the poor, instead of making him a client or her a client, seeking market-raised profits, we will be able to, to raise so much private capital that we actually can solve the world, world's poverty and environmental problems, which is in essence the 17 sustainability goals. So our company is all about this. Oh, oh sorry, go back. Um, our company is all about this. So we, we raise capital in the north, in the red uh, capitals, and we invest them in the south through our offices in the blue capitals. And uh, as the moderator uh, said, we are actually investing around a billion dollars per year. And we are actually a small example of the scalability because none of you have heard about responsibility, but you have heard um, you are proud of our, our uh, government budget. Now, we are as big as the government budget. We have more than $30 billion under management with very happy investors in the north. And in fact, we have raised nearly 1 billion nook in the last couple of years here in Norway from pension funds and others, including Yara's pension fund, by the way, who, who find it now a very attractive proposition to invest uh, pension funds into the south. Now, to, to give you the link between traditional bistand and what we are doing, look at the pyramid. You know, we are, we are the fortunate ones at the top. The second billion is the breadwinners in the south. Then you have the bottom billion, and the bottom billion is the billion that unfortunately will always be subject to, uh, uh, to natural disasters due to climate, war, hunger, and others. In this segment, obviously, traditional philanthropic capital is the only thing that works. What we are doing, we are addressing the next three billion. And where do we address them? We address them, like many other players in this space, in the three major SDG-oriented sectors. We create uh, banks, banking systems. So we are a systemic investor. We, we build saving banks in the South. Uh, we create huge cooperative solutions in agriculture and invest in productivity, and of course, in renewable energy. Now, and we have private equity and private debt solutions. So we also obviously measure what we're doing because we are seeking, as you might have understood, what we call a triple bottom line. So we have a very complicated investment universe because we invest only in emerging markets, only in companies that have an inclusive impact on the excluded people and only in companies that have a positive environmental footprint. That's a complicated territory. But we have here today many examples in Africa. We invest in Africa, obviously, but other places as well. That shows that this can, can be done. But if you get what you measure, so if you, are, if you want triple bottom line, you can't only measure your finance, financial return. You've got to in, uh, measure your social and environmental return, which gives us the next foil just a very b b brief sample of what we are measuring. Just a few things. Our companies are, uh, uh, have revenues of $13 billion per year. That's 100 billion nook. The interesting thing is that these are all products and services that benefit the poor people. 
they're affordable for the poor people, and they can be bought. They also create export revenues for these countries, which is, of course, very healthy for their, for their trade balances. Uh, we pay f f more than half a billion dollars in taxes. Uh, as you can see, we have many employees and a big proportion of women. I'll come back to that. We measure the number of hectares we are uh, uh, improving productivity of. We measure the savings in CO2 tons, which is quite high. And then we have something on the top here which is important. That's called market infrastructure transformations. There is a misconception about microfinance that this is sort of lending groups and sort of very small money that women, women borrow. This is changing. We are the biggest player in banking in the world. We call them still MFIs, microfinance institutions, but they are no, that's not what they are. Because Africa and the rest of the developing world have grown 20% per year over the last 25 years. So our transformations, we have moved the lending and informal um, uh, financial institutions over from informality to formality to be regulated and to become banks. And the borrowers have gone with them. Let's take a look. A couple of things. Agriculture. Cooperatives is a big game. There are many things in agri, but, but in order to reach global value chains, you need solidarity, you need bargaining power. This is what happens. Now, what's the problem here from a female perspective? 80% of the work is done by women. What are the land rights of women? We are working quite significantly with this already in 2013, which is the last half number, a hard number. We have more than 60,000 of our members were female. female. In uh, microfinance, here is a wonderful example of a Kenyan female banking, banking leader. There are not many of them. But, but this is wrong. 80% um, of uh, lending goes to women. And this, this is despite the fact that most of the large banking institutions are not gender sensitive. They just lend out to people who want money, who have ideas and need money and can pay back. Finally, uh, uh, this, I, I love this example, and, and some, somebody else mentioned it before. Uh, what is, from a female perspective, that what is the impact of solar energy distribution? We call this in our company female, the, the female empowerment solution. The health impact, the, the, the liberation of time, uh, time, uh, time uh, saved by children now being able to read their homework at, school, at, at home in the evening, time, time saved by women not longer having to go out and, and find fuel out in the forest. This is a huge transform, transformative solution. Now, so, so what are then, uh, as I said, we are, frankly, our passion is not women. Our passion is development. But then, what's our observation? That's our observation. <laughs> if, you, if you want to get the job done, ask a woman. I have spoken with, with many of our associates at, at our Nairobi office. Young women, like many of, 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 of the African women here, super educated, really talented. They are, and I've sp uh, really spoken seriously about their careers. And one of my observations is that there is a huge cultural uh, male-female problem here. Our 28-year-old, 30-year-old girls who you know, outweigh their potential husbands by a mile, they have a different attitude because the men have a different attitude in Kenya and other places. So there is a lot to be done here of cultural stereotypes. What, what, we, what, what our numbers, they look like this. As I said, 90,000 of our employees are women. And then comes another Im important thing. You know, our banking institution have 38 million customers. Nearly as many deposit takers, people with bank accounts that they deposit money in, as lenders. 81% of our lenders are women. And here comes the misconception about microfinance. They don't borrow $50 they borrow $1,617. 
Think about that number in the South. Many of our female clients are real entrepreneurs who build businesses that employs other people. Still, where are the females, uh, female leaders and entrepreneurs? Here we have, of course, some, some still huge challenges, although we see some positive signs in our businesses. Uh, all of this is, is clear uh, uh, discrimination on all levels, fundamentally. Uh, the majority of poor people are women. The majority of people who don't have a bank account are women. Uh, there are more women dying uh, than men for all kinds of various reasons. The discrimination is, these are just a couple of examples. You know, look at labor force participation in Latin America, land ownership in sub-Saharan Africa, access to financial uh, services in Middle East, North Africa, literacy in Southeast Asia. You know, this list goes on and on. And somebody mentions legal bar barriers. 90% of 143 economies have at least one legal difference between men and women, and 28 countries have more than 10 legal differences. No wonder why illiteracy is higher among women than among men. So what can actually be done here? And, and uh, First of all, a lot of people have, have today given a, some very interesting uh, reflections and points of views and arguments of what can be done. And I think you know it, it, it's, it's a little bit pretentious to sort of you know bring up the solution because it's not not that easy. But there are we have uh, made a colloquium in our our team here before we came, and, and there are some large themes that we can discuss. The most difficult one is the first one on this list. We talked about stereotypes. That's what I reflected to in Kenya, as an example. These stereotypes have to disappear. Uh, and how do you do that? And in our opinion, there are a couple of things that the public sector can do, and this is the political leadership question. The first is to build capacities and institutions oriented towards women. Um, this has happened in the past. If you look back 150 years in, in the history of Europe, we have done this. This can absolutely also be done in the South. Of course, affirmative action, also quotations, uh, quoting, an absolute necessity, in my opinion. Uh, quotations in uh, middle education, higher education, um, uh, workplaces, leadership, and board positions. So, so the Norwegian model that we are proud of, I think, is actually quite well, works quite well. The private sector uh, should do what many of our presenters have talked about, target setting and promoting inclusive growth. And from, from, from our, our company, for example, we had we are a Swiss-based company, and we had 0% women in our board four years ago. Now it's 30%. We had zero women in the executive management team. Now we have 25%. We are now setting targets for the companies we invest in that they have to have 30% participation in middle man management positions going forward. Uh, and of course, for our, in our case, promoting inclusive growth is, is, goes a little bit with the territory. So this was a very quick rundown of you know, the perspectives on women, uh, leadership, and entrepreneurship. I hope you actually saw from our big scope that we see hope. We see real results. Things are happening, but it's still a long way to go. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Christian. That was very interesting, very interesting, a great presentation. Uh, we're coming into the final third of the day. In fact, we're coming into the final uh, segment uh, of the day. Uh, and here, I'll ask uh, five thinkers uh, to come and join me on the set. I think I'm going to have to stand because uh, I don't have a chair myself, but that's OK. I've been sitting. So um, I want them to uh, come up and discuss what we've learned from the day and, uh, more importantly, what we should do next. Uh, so there's also a sixth panelist, by the way, and that's not on the stage. Um, that's you, all of you. Uh, 
um, because we haven't really heard from the audience. And there's a wealth of knowledge here. There are questions, but there are also interventions that you can make. So um, please speak up, because this is an opportunity in this segment for you to uh, make your observations or ask your questions. And not, by the way, just of, of the people who are on the stage. From the earlier speakers that are not on the stage, you can also uh, um, comment on what they've said or ask them questions as well. So for the final panel, uh, I'll welcome uh, Katya Nor. God. Now, I think she's having a microphone put on. Have you got your microphone, Katia? Yes, she has. We're super fast in this operation. Um, Katia, welcome. Uh, Katia is the Director General uh, of the Department for Economic Relations and Development. And you're, you're under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, are you not? Yes, and we heard from the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs earlier, a fantastic speech. So you're very welcome. It's good to have a representative from the Ministry here. Uh, also uh, joining you, Kirsty Oss has been a member of Yara's board since 2016. Uh, she's Yara's Sustainability Development Director. Um, I'll also welcome back, you've seen them already, but they're coming back for this final conversation, which is great, uh, the former director of No Ceilings, Terry McC uh, McCullough. Terry, where are you? Terry. Uh, Sally Gitonga of BPI. Please join us, Sally. Um, uh, take one of the green seats. And uh, uh, to round all this up, uh, last but not least, Elizabeth Vasquez from We Connect. This is your final panel. Give them a round of applause. Take, uh, oh, okay, I think you're going to have to sit. One of you is going to have to sit here. Great, okay, so, uh, right, going to I'm going to stand, oh. yes. <laughs> oh, I can sit, if you want me to sit, I can just grab a, do you want me to sit? Let's, let's we're all friends here. Uh, I'll just, if I can disconnect that, yes, I'm going to sit, since you insisted. Okay, that's better, isn't it? That's better, okay, so, um, all right, okay, so I'm not going to ask a lot of questions, because I want the audience to, 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 to um, join in here. Um, but I will probably just open this up. I won't go around to each of you. I'll just, who's uh, fastest fingers first, basically. So um, what have you heard uh, from this day? And it's been a rich, it's been rich dialogue. It's been, it's been good, hasn't it? It's been really good. What have you heard that really sort of jumped out at you that you thought was, I haven't heard that before. That's mm. kind of like, that's why I, why I came here. Anyone? Mm. Uh, it's something that I've heard before, but I think something that's worth noting for all of us was our discussion uh, uh, a little bit around challenges both with girls and with boys, and that as we are looking at progress moving forward, our conversation around what gender means has to be much more inclusive mm. from a much earlier age. And, and Katya, uh, you... you um I want to just bring you in specifically as the Director General of the Department for Economic Relations and Development. What is that exactly? It means that uh, we are taking care both of Norwegian economic interests, but also uh, of our development assistance to the developing countries. So, so the issue of gender, as you're not just staying within uh, Norway, but you're spreading ideas, Norwegian ideas to a great degree, um, uh, abroad in de to develop relationships, because really you're a relationship developer. That's what you are for Norway. Uh, you make Absolutely. connections, new connections Absolutely. for Norway. Um, what's the conversation within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs when it comes to gender issues? What are you saying amongst yourselves? Well, I think I can, can assure you that, that gender equality is really, it's, it's high up on every agenda and it's, it's a cross-cutting theme uh, on everything we do. And I think Norway is really known for always bringing up the issue of, of uh, sort of women empowerment. And You have and an obligation to some degree to hold yeah, but, that up, don't you? Because yeah, but it's also, as was said before here, it gives economic sense. Economic sense. It makes sense. It, it's, countries would grow and prosper if they made use of their women. And that, that's something we try to bring across. It's not just that we are a liberal country, you know, with strong women up north here, but we have seen how important it is for our economy. Mm. So this, uh, I think it's very important argument to bring across, because as has been said, there's a lot of cultural barriers mm. still uh, around and, and perceptions around what the role of women should be. So it needs to be repeated and repeated again and again. But how do you deal with that? <coughs> Let's put, I like to paint pictures in my mind of, of say, of, of what you do, for example. So if you're engaging governments in Southeast Asia and in Africa, you're sitting with policymakers, ministers, um, heads of departments like yourself. Do you consciously, as the Norwegian government, are you given a remit to bring this subject up? Are you, do you feel it's, you're obligated 
be, because Norway is a champion of gender diversity, to put it on the table in front of people, cult uh, cultural um, issues taken into consideration. Do you think this is something that we have to discuss before we leave the room? Or is it just organically as it happens? I mean, what's the approach? Well, it depends, of course, where you are, but it's, it's both. It's organically. I think it comes natural for, for every Norwegian politician traveling. And I think that goes uh, um, without sort of which uh, sort of uh, political background you have. But it's also part because a lot of the projects we're doing, a lot of the sort of, uh, if, if we are in countries where we give assistance, uh, development assistance, it's a natural part of the programs uh, we're doing. So it's, uh, no, I, I think it's really, I think, um, uh, Norway can be counted on really as, as talking about this as, as an organic thing in a way and, and really uh, making a strong case for the, the, the necessities to, to give room for women. Now, the biggest company, do you know, <coughs> guess what the biggest company operating in Africa is? Does anybody know? Uh, and it's not Statoil, it's, it's Yara. <laughs> exactly. Yara is the biggest company with big business interests in Africa. Am I not wrong? Mm. I, I learned this from the yes. last NABA conference. And we're also the, the company that has the longest presence in Africa. We've oh, I didn't know that. You have the longest years. presence as well. Mm. So, I mean, part of that success has had to be that you've understood cultural mores that uh, have been discussed. But you've also tried to uh, spread those good ideas. I just want to understand from the Yara perspective, because I know you have a deep and rich culture and you have methods, methodology, methods to, to engaging uh, on the ground, what are they? Uh, we are doing tra farmer trainings so on the ground. And uh, I mean, the history of the company starts with innovation. When uh, Europe was at the brink of famine uh, in the beginning of the 1900s, then um, our inventors, our founders, uh, found a method to uh, take nitrogen from the air and make it available for the plants. And in uh, all uh, or being, uh, I'm trying to be humble, but it is the most important invention on the planet. It saved 2.7 billion lives the last 100 years. Mm. So um, our mission is mm. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> our mission is to responsibly feed the world and protect the planet. So uh, our core business is respons responding to the sustainable development goals. Mm. But also, I mean, gender equality, as has been said many times today, is uh, not only an outcome of goal number five. It's it's a prerequisite to yeah. achieve the other goals. Mm. And uh, we, as a, a company, have a long way to go to have. Uh, gender balance mm -hmm. and uh, also the private sector in general. And I mean, uh, what I've seen today, I'm so proud of what we've, uh, the progress we've seen from the movie f uh, with the um, attitudes from 1981 uh, towards having uh, our new Minister of Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. standing here as a super role model. Uh, so I'm just so proud of being, uh, being in a region. But when it comes to private sector, I mean, the last eight years, uh, the 50 largest companies on the Oslo Stock Exchange have recruited uh, in total 50 CEOs, and two of those have been women. Mm. So we have a long way to go. Long way to go. And also, it, we, we talked about partnerships and connections. One of the biggest connections is start sitting right here. Yes. Private sector, mm. and policy makers mm. working together, Absolutely. and it's organic. It's not just coming up with a solution and applying mm. it. It's a mm. constantly evolving, changing system. Yeah. Um, uh, w the Norwegians seem to have it, to some degree, pretty, pretty right, or at least that conversation mm. is going on. I want to maybe bring in mm. the rest of you. How do policy makers work with private sector to solve this, th these challenges? Maybe mm. Elizabeth Vasquez. <laughs> so it's definitely increasing because I think everyone recognizes that in the past governments were the largest entity with the largest budgets and the largest uh, impact and the on largest their economy by the way. and the largest and that is changing the private sector we now have corporations that are larger than most governments most mm. economies um, country economies and so he's talking about you Google where are you <laughs> <laughs> and so it's it's an economic imperative that mm. they figure out better ways to work together mm. for jobs for inclusive growth for wealth creation. Uh, and so I see a lot of the governments we work with, whether it's um, DFED or Global Affairs Canada, um, many of these uh, governments that focus not only internally but externally on the development agenda, mm. 
-hmm. are saying, look, we have to make sure that the money that we're providing for development mm -hmm. is going to help both the men and the women and use taxpayer dollars that are coming from men and women so that everyone benefits um, mm -hmm. from development. Mm -hmm. And so increasingly, they're starting to have their own inclusive sourcing agendas, but they're also increasingly wanting to see um, what's called national content or local content. Mm -hmm. So they're local requiring content corporations that want to do business in their country to demonstrate that they're spending some of that money um, on the local people and employing the local people. Mm -hmm. So corporations, if you're going to be, if you want to be smart, you want to get ahead of that. You don't want to wait for government regulation to make you do it. You want to be doing it actively because it's in your business interest to find mm -hmm. the best employees, the best suppliers, the most educated people who are healthy because you've invested in those communities. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an exciting time. So, so what you're simply saying, the equation is inclusion and diversity equals sustainability, which is in your title, isn't it, really? Uh, that's what you're effectively saying, which, which often uh, you have to make the case for, you have to bang the drum for and clearly state that. Over in Africa, uh, over yeah. in Africa, we were talking about governments. Governments mm. employ more people than anyone else exactly. in many countries, more than agriculture. Yeah. Yes. You have uh, government mm. workers than you have. I know in my mm. country, mm -hmm. in Nigeria, that's mm -hmm. the case. Mm. Um, these conversations you're hearing here, mm. tell me how much that's resonating in Africa mm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's been very interesting to see, especially like uh, back home in Kenya, some of the initiatives that the government has taken in the past few years. We've seen deliberate efforts in promoting um, women and youth and the government being the largest spender, mm -hmm. actually, um, not only an employer, um, has created certain quarters where they say that um, for 40 percent of purchases or tenders must go to women-owned businesses. Government tenders. Government yeah. tenders in different areas, whether it's printing or construction. And so what you find, what is evolving now, is that private businesses are changing ownership where you had a husband and wife, a husband with higher shareholding. He's transferring the shareholding, a higher shareholding to his wife so that they can benefit because the businesses have to also have a certain shareholding to qualify as a woman-owned business so that they can also qualify for those um, government jobs. So it's good because it's empowering the women in terms of empowering them in terms of ownership of the business, and then they're able to then tender and get these jobs. And then in addition to that, we've also seen um, the government also setting up a woman fund to basically support um, women-owned businesses. Are these microfinance uh, funds or are they yes, SME, SME they're, medium they're size? Ma mainly micro, micro, but really yes. encouraging women to access government-set funds mm. for, for their businesses. Which and quite often it's just, fund. it's just men mostly in the past exactly. that would get access yeah. to such a thing. And that is addressing a huge problem we have in Africa that relates to ownership of land, mm. which is used as security, mm. which otherwise the women would not be able to access loans from other traditional yeah, finances. Chris, Christian mentioned... Exactly. Uh, the, the, so having um, initiatives such as those from the public sector supporting private sector um, is good initiative an area for improvement that i see which you know which goes back to what i've what we've had today mm. you know take home for me is is where i'm seeing like uh, with the norwegians the execution um, of the whole process in terms of the ownership of women in terms of uh, business and what is done if the implementation is not done mm. So we're really saying in Kenya we have 62 listed companies, but only 21 percent um, of the women sit on those boards. Yet mm. our quota says our constitution provides for 30 percent. Mm. So what then are the penalties for not achieving that? And it's exciting. It's interesting to see that this is being done here. So it's not just to set the laws, but let's have them implemented um, mm. with certain This is like TED, penalties. This thing, isn't it? Like, yeah. It's like <laughs> ideas worth spreading. <laughs> yes. Now that is yeah. the number one idea that I think Norway has that's has, worth spreading. It's worth Not spreading. only the policies, yes. but mm. how do you enforce and implement policies exactly. from a government level? Yeah, well, I'm not sure if I have the answer to that for, for other countries, <laughs> but I just wanted to, to stress the importance of the political commitment to, mm -hmm. uh, to do uh, encouragement for women in a country. Yeah. The tone at the top is just, as it's important in a company, mm -hmm. but absolutely so in a country as well. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I'm very impressed to hear that Kenya, Kenya has taken such a mm -hmm. forward-leaning uh, sort mm -hmm. of attitude, because that's absolutely not the case in many countries. Mm -hmm. So, but and once you set the goals, I mean, then we have civil society, we have others. Mm. Hold them accountable, 
So sort of when you vote in elections, make your sort of uh, show that you are uh, serious. But of course, you also need uh, institutions that can follow up, that can make sure that you know that you have uh, good statistics, data, and so on and so on. And when you have it as a, in concert, when you have the uh, harmony in the in the sound of this, it's it's the private sector evangelizing together with government because mm. whenever I walk into um, the offices of ministers around Africa, I mm. exclusively work in Africa, mm. um, I rarely see representatives from other governments except the Chinese. But other than that, um, I usually see private sector uh, mm. businesses, Scandinavian, American, waiting in the waiting room to see the minister. Mm. They're the guys that have the, the greatest access mm. uh, to influence uh, ministers and people in policy making mm. positions uh, in places like Africa, mm. even more mm. so than the foreign ministries mm. uh, or, or foreign companies. So it's important that everybody understands that they have to evangelize. Now, I have a microphone here and I'm not afraid to use it. In fact, I've switched <laughs> it on. Do not be afraid. But I want to, t uh, we have to take some questions here. Who's going to be bold enough to ask the first question? Uh, Madam, okay, here you go. Um, stand up, tell us who you are. Um, you have to stand up, tell us who you are and ask your question. Make your comment. And it's working, yeah? I'm Kari Ege. I'm the founder and the CEO of uh, Half the World Women Knowledge Leadership. I have a past of 20 years in the UN, and UN hasn't at all been mentioned in these sessions, mm -hmm. which I, is a little bit of... Uh, encouragement to speak, because I think in governments, and especially we, had, we shouldn't divide the world in those who have access and those who haven't got access, but it's come across that we have been talking a lot about them from the north to the south without maybe recognizing it. And I think one of the bridging factors in the developing world, where I've been working for 30 years, is the UN. It's the civil society and the UN and the governments. And there's no government who has developed and come to the stage of the emerging markets who haven't had a strong government entity. Government leadership and government supportive systems. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the reason I'm saying this is that we have to look at this holistically and look at the actors on the ground. We're talking about partnership, we talk about new connections, and we new, need to look at the whole family. Yeah. And I think I'm just encouraging you to think about then who are the, role, the actors in your countries whom we can connect with and whom can make the big difference that we want to see in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody want to re uh, respond mm. to that? That was quite interesting. I feel like I've I lived at the UN for the last two years as a member of the UN High Level Panel on Women's Economic Empowerment. But what was interesting in working with the Secretary General um, and the head of UN Women uh, was the urgency, um, the imperative they have to do more with the private sector. I was really surprised because historically it was the UN itself, right? We can do all of this. And with governments, it was amazing how much had been done by the UN itself in working with mm -hmm. governments. But now there's a huge shift because of the lack of resources coming from various governments. So the sustainability of the work of the UN um, is really increasingly um, uh, having stronger partnerships with the private sector. So I, thought, I just found that was very, very interesting um, to see and be asked on numerous occasions to help build bridges between the UN system and the private sector. And I think the potential for that is, is huge because there are things that the UN system or other multilaterals, we also do a lot with the World Bank and the, the IFC, um, that um, they're uniquely qualified to do and the private sector doesn't yet have a full appreciation or understanding of what the power of those um, umbrella organizations can do. So I think there's a lot of work to be done on educating different stakeholders about what value they add um, and what's unique to that particular organization or that group um, that the other organizations, um, public sector, private sector, probably shouldn't be doing because that's not their core competency. So I think we have to be honest about who's best positioned to do various things. And I would just add, you mentioned scarce resources. I think something we have not talked a lot about is uh, uh, funding from a gender lens. It's no accident that when I talked about the, the progress we've made over the last 20 years had been in women's health and education because millions of dollars had been poured into that effort, the focus on the year of the girl, to make that change. 
when there are no additional resources that come, you make decisions about, well, do we move to another area? Do we double down on these areas? You have to have holistic collaboration to ensure that you can figure out a way to move forward in a lot of these different areas that affect women. Let's bring in the private sector, mm. Yara. Yes, and I, I completely agree that we need to move out of our comfort zone when it comes to collaborations. And one example we have with the UN organization, the World Food Program, uh, is a partnership in Tanzania where we saw that we can help the farmers triple their yields, but the World Food Program is uh, sourcing food for billions uh, of dollars. So they saw that um, they could do double good by sourcing that food from the poorest farmers. And we want the farmers to get access to markets. So we launched a partnership with the World Food Pro Program last year, and already now we have reached 73,000 farmers with training in good ergonomical practices mm. and to avoid post-harvest uh, loss before mm. the food reaches the market. Got to stay with uh, Norwegian, big Norwegian companies. Anna from Stato, you have a comment. <laughs> yes. Um, no, I think you make an ex excellent point. Uh, Stato has recently joined the UN's Global Innovation Coalition for Change, mm -hmm. looking at how the private sector can come together with the academia, with the nonprofit sector, uh, to support gender equality, to support empowerment of women, and in particular, looking at how technology is actually an enabler for women and for mm. girls to succeed. So bringing together, you know, companies as diverse as Statoil, Facebook, I think uh, Google is also a key uh, co contributing to that, Johnson & Johnson, mm -hmm. and then NASA, uh, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and see how we can actually all come together to support through technology, women's empowerment and uh, innovation with women. Katya, I think you should have the final word from the mm. government's voice. Yeah, no, just to, to underline, and it's been said here, I think that we are now in an era where we see that we need to bring in different uh, actors. And, and of course, Norway has been always working very, very closely with the UN and of course the World Bank and so on. But now we see there is a need for new kind of partnerships and, and, and bringing in the private sector. And, and you mentioned it. I think one of the things that we must not overlook is the, the issue about technology, mm. how to make sure that, that uh, the developing countries really can reap the same benefits as we do when it comes to uh, using new technology. And that will require that we work together in quite a different way. And, and I think we have good examples, so we just have to scale them up and, and do more of it. Mm. One of the most powerful things in all this is a technological, has a technological solution, mm. uh, and that is, uh, is data. Exactly. Uh, and, and you mentioned, Terry, mm. I think you said data is key. And there are too many unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. and, and before you start making changes, you have to understand the scale of the, uh, of the challenges mm -hmm. and the changes that are happening day to day. So, I mean, I, I just want to you to uh, elaborate on that. How do we get, how do we, if data is key, how do we get there so the data is working for us? Mm -hmm. To this point of technology, we now know there are 200 million fewer women in the developing world that have access to the internet than men do. Mm. That makes a significant difference in how you can uh, uh, strive for economic Did you say 200 million? 200 million fewer women, women. in the developing wow. world. Wow. It's a, you know, there is a gender difference in all of mm. these spaces. We need to collect this data. Governments and corporations need to invest in them. We need to be transparent. Google put out uh, its data around its number of women engineers mm. some time ago. You know, it's not easy to be transparent when those numbers are low, but it holds you accountable to what you need to achieve and everyone can work together mm. to do so. So data makes, uh, data measures so that, that we can manage this information and we can make change. Okay, let's, let's take another question then. <laughs> let's see, from this side, somebody from this side. I know someone's going to put their hand. There's no way. They're winning. They're winning over here. Who's going to put their hand up? No? Anybody? Am I, is there someone over here? I know there's somebody with a question. No? Nobody with a question? Uh, okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> Natalie, you're from South Africa. Yes. And um, I'm from a company called Thought Leader Global. Um, we recently were part of a... Um, Yes, of course. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I've flitted to Norge. Pogrunov Charlie Het. So I married a Norwegian. 
I'm here. Thank you. Thank you for a great discussion, and thank you, Mark, for excellent moderating. Um, I have a question. Recently, we were part of an um, event where they spoke about um, issues at board level, gender issues, inclusiveness, sustainability. One of the issues that came up was that um, one of the reasons why putting women onto boards or getting women onto boards didn't necessarily translate into women being represented at high levels in organizations was the fact that when women did get onto boards, there was an issue with these women, which were sometimes few and far between, who didn't then want to be seen as quoted women and didn't want to draw attention to themselves as the token person by then speaking about and creating an issue around gender in the place where they had been elected to. So that was perhaps one of the reasons, because when women get there, they are um, there's a culture that doesn't really encourage um, drawing attention to yourself around gender issues when you've got there. So do we have any reflections from the Aristine panel on that particular question, and perhaps a way forward and way we can address that? So it's a bit of a catch-22 situation. Mm. Interesting. I think this issue of numbers and tipping points is very important. I read some data that said it really takes a, a tipping point of about a 30% of women on boards to make that change. But when you are the only, whether it is the only woman, the only person of color, in any given situation, people look at you as the diversity person, the gender yeah, person. Yeah. The, you have to take a role that you didn't ask for, really. <laughs> and is part of yeah. who you are. You are a competent and skilled person mm. who happens to be mm. uh, yeah. a woman. And you need to bring all of that to the board. But you become that representative. The so champion. the more, the, the greater the numbers, uh, uh, the, the more you let the air out of the tension of that yeah. issue. And the pressure on the individuals who are there mm -hmm. alone sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think um, uh, the more we talk about uh, that it's important with gender balance, uh, the, the more it becomes uh, natural and a good circle. But we have to talk about uh, encouraging each other to be bold. We have to also see each other as, uh, as uh, role models, that we can encourage our sisters, our colleagues, our friends mm -hmm. to actually uh, be brave and, and make uh, or move into positions. That and in a way, you're talking about necessary. mentoring, because whenever you think mm -hmm. about mentoring, yeah. you always think about someone older and more experienced mentoring someone who is mm -hmm. less experienced. But that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You can mentor no. your friends. You yes. can mention mm -hmm. people, mentor people on the same level yes. as you. We can all exchange mm -hmm. ideas, can't we? And just encourage each other. Yeah. Let's take another question over here, madam. Please stand up. Tell me what you do, who you are, <laughs> what your question is. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kristin Hetler. I'm a gender advisor at Save the Children Norway, previously with, uh, in the leadership group of UN Women, where I was for five years. One thing that we haven't talked about today, which I think is an important element, is, as we know, entrepreneurship can be many things. And for very many women, and men for that matter, mm. entrepreneurship is the last resort when no other options are available, because there is no good employment to find, and then you try to make a living out of whatever you can. So we, we need to, to bear that in mind as well. And that brings me to another point, and that's the importance of responsible private sector and good governance setting the right ramifications for the private sector. There are big companies doing a lot of interesting initiatives to recruit women. These same companies are trying to pay as little taxes as possible. They're going from one tax haven to the next. Taxes are what fuels the public sector. Taxes are what makes it, uh, taxes that are put into good use in the public sector in any given country, Norway as an example, is what allows uh, a healthcare system, uh, it's what allows social security and, and, and education and social protection, and I think this is kind of a missing element when we talk about the role of, um, of the private sector in stimulating leadership and women's entrepreneurship. Let's not forget that we need responsible government and responsible tax paying, uh, not tax evading, uh, private sector. We see it in the textile industry, for example, where there's a race to the bottom. Every big corporation making clothes are looking for the country where they will have to pay the lowest wages. 
And it's kind of a paradox because in some of these countries, textile industry has meant that so many more women now can earn a living. But it's, they also know that the moment some of, their, uh, some of these businesses find a country that are willing to underbid them even more, these, th this, th these may not be secure jobs. So I think we shall not forget the importance of good governance systems, uh, taxes, and a strong public sector to also uh, enable a healthy uh, pr private sector and the responsibility of the private sector in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. You couldn't have painted the picture more clearly. Mm. Response, please, from my esteemed... Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's an issue that is also coming back to us because I think we as consumers are forcing those co companies or these companies are, they all the time have to supply us with cheap uh, textile uh, products. So I think, again, we as consumers have a lot of responsibility for that race. But I also think the issue of uh, what companies are allowed to do in a country is very much up to the local government as well. So we, we need to have to make sure that the local governments also put those regulations for foreign investors in their own country. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is sometimes overlooked. I mean, a, a local government or national government can put standards that uh, also the international companies can uh, adhere to. Mm -hmm. But I think another issue that, that is important in this regard is that we also, I mean, the issue is there's not jobs. There's not enough investments in, in Africa. I mean, there, it's mostly informal jobs. So I think we also have to look at what, what can we do in order to make it more attractive to invest for those uh, responsible uh, companies to go to Africa and invest there and then grow and employ and so on. So I think that's also part of the, of the, the issue here. Mm -hmm. Why is it that, that uh, investments are actually going, are, are going down? instead of, of, of going up. So again, I think this is issues that we need to raise in our conversations. Yeah, yeah just wanted to add on to um, the comment that you made, uh, especially on uh, entrepreneurship and women in entrepreneurship. And yes, there aren't many jobs around anymore. And um, I don't think, especially as women, we should see entrepreneurship as a, as a last result. We should see it as something where we can actually build mm -hmm. empires. And, and, and we really need to encourage each other as women globally, uh, because what has, what has actually been seen through studies is that women were more of nurturers, so we, we always want to make sure the home is still safe, so we are, less, um, we are more risk averse, and stepping out into risky businesses is not really our forte, and that's why you find, like for example, when we're making um, funding quarters, like in some of us in our organizations, we want to make sure that at least 30% of the portfolio is women-owned businesses and that we can mentor them. So the conversation needs to be around encouraging women to really step out and go into entrepreneurship and not to fear that because they can actually do it. They can actually do it the way the men, the men has done and that needs to be an ongoing conversation because it's an alternative to wealth creation. Mm. Yeah. I yeah. realize many of these great ideas that yes. people have that yeah. never see the light of, of, of day. Exactly. Um, yeah. Inga over here is the communications chief for North Fund, and she has something to communicate. Is it from Inga <laughs> or is it from North Fund? Um, yeah, I think this is from Inga. But I, because I really think that this, uh, this uh, event today is really encouraging. And it gives us so much hope for all the potential for, uh, that you can present. And uh, I, I've just been thinking, Looking at this wonderful panel today, with really uh, uh, not not knowledgeable and uh, strong women, and with then a moderator being a man, it's quite the opposite what we normally see when we have <laughs> conferences. Um, and then I wonder, one of you said earlier today that now we really need to involve the men in this discussion. And when I look here today, I mean, we have a very opposite uh, balance mm. than what we normally see. So my question to you is, I really would like next year to be a conference where there's 50-50 real gender mm. balance, both in the panel and in the, in the hall here. What can we do? How can we make all the men be interested in this topic as well. Easy, everyone brings one man. <laughs> Your hardest question of all. Oh, it's easy. It's bring, easy. Bring one man next year. No. <laughs> and Not that hard. Also, don't... All of you. I would say also, I celebrate all you men who have uh, uh, spent the day with us today, but let's, let's pivot to holding men more accountable. I was so struck by one of the earlier panels when you challenged um, the notion of the, the lack of female 
investors. Mm -hmm. Why are we not challenging the bias of the male investor who can't understand mm -hmm. the great consumer power of a great woman-owned product? Mm -hmm. Why are we not holding men more accountable for these biases? Have them ex work harder to examine, mm -hmm. educate themselves, help to educate them. Mm -hmm. Is it that they don't understand it or they just don't want to listen? That's the, the, the I issue. I mean, the first step is that you've got to, I mean, they'll understand it if they listen, but they're not listening. So we've got to get them to listen. Mm -hmm. My impression is that there's a lot of men who are engaged in these issues, um, mm -hmm. young, modern, and also some older <laughs> are engaged. And in the private sector, lots of, of, mm -hmm. of uh, men are also engaged. So I think it's, uh, I'm sure it will be possible to find uh, participants. Anna, <laughs> again. No, I, I, I fully agree with your point. Uh, I think we need, to make, we need to make the conversation inclusive from our end. It's about gender balance. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just reflecting on the comment around the female, you know, female board members. At Stadol, if I look around our senior leadership team, the most diverse team is actually a team that is led by a male. Mm -hmm. He's built the most diverse team around him. Mm -hmm. And that, it wasn't by accident. Mm -hmm. It's actually... Conscious very conscious, conscious extremely deliberate, mm. surrounding himself with women, surrounding himself with people of different backgrounds, different nationalities. So I think, to your point, I think there's a lot of males that are really active in mm. this conversation that we just need to make the conversation even more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a tremendous amount of potential if we actually bring our voices together. Mm -hmm. And we've only got five minutes left, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask you to pull out that mystical crystal ball that I mentioned at the beginning of the conference and look <laughs> into it and tell us what the future holds. Anyone, who's gonna start? Elizabeth Vasquez. I see us getting organized and being sick and tired of being sick and tired. We're half the population, you guys, come on. <laughs> really, we're half the population. If we decide today that this is no longer acceptable, as we see from the campaign that, you know, the Me Too, we have to get organized and pick five things that we're going to work on together until we achieve them and then pick five more because there are, there are thousands and thousands of challenges and barriers, but there's also thousands and thousands of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a, a lot of it is there are real barriers, but there are also barriers in our own minds. And we have to be honest about those barriers and be honest about the fact that we're half the population. We're the ones raising these boys and these girls. Mm -hmm. We need to make some changes in addition to men having consciousness and being our partners in this because it's in their interest for all of us mm -hmm. to prosper. Sally Gitonga. Yes, um, for me, it's really to do with um, what the statistics and the facts have shown. Women are good and better business people. I've seen it from our industry. They're better pairs. They run their businesses better. And so we need to encourage them. We need to encourage them to step up and really, really take, take those risks. Again, the statistics have shown that when we have more women in boards and senior management positions, the performance of these businesses are actually doing better. So we need to create that gender balance. I'm not saying we get away, we do, we do away with the men, but the gender balance must be a conscious decision, especially those women of us who are in leadership position to drive so that we can, we can see better, better, better performances. Yeah. Kirsty, Sustainability De Development Director for, for Yara. Yes, I, I'm an engineer, so I want to give the boring <laughs> answer. And that is that we have, there's no magic pill. We have to work systematically on this. We have to work systematically on the short term with mm -hmm. succession planning, but also long term to make sure that we have a good gender balance in the whole workforce at all levels. Um, so we have to work with the proce processes mm -hmm. and the programs and to do also local adaptions of the strategy we have. So, but the potential is huge. So there's hope. Yeah. And we're talking about economic relations and development, which happens to be your department, Kathy. Yeah, Yeah, I'm afraid I'm only cautiously optimistic. Mm. I think uh, the forces against the positive development are quite strong. So uh, it will take longer, I'm afraid, than what we think. And, mm. and, and also it, it takes, we can't rest one day. It takes a lot of work. And it has to be raised on all levels. We have to make networks. We have to to be there, we have to raise it in the UN, we have to talk about it, but it's, it's, it's not going to be an easy, I mean, now I'm talking globally, mm. uh, so I, I think there is, unfortunately, a long way to go. Terry, 
you, what was it? What was it? You, we were called, it was called no, no ceilings. No right? ceilings. How do we get to no, no ceilings? No ceilings. No ceilings was, you know, just the yeah. play on the glass and the idea that we would remove them and remove the barriers to equality for women. I think it is a new, exciting time with a sense of urgency like never before. Women feeling like they are eager to lead change. And it is both the imperative of the individual mm. to determine how she needs to, to best prepare herself to do that. Mm. And it's about us holding institutions accountable to ensure they are as inclusive as possible to uh, allow women to, to do the leading that we deserve. Now, if I could ask you all to rise, and I could, if I could ask you, the volume of your applause now indicates how much you enjoyed that and what you <laughs> So, please, all, all rise. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We started the day with uh, one of the hardest working people to make this thing happen uh, from Care Norway, uh, Gree Larson, and we're going to end uh, the day with Gree Larson. Please come and say your final closing remarks. Dear, dear friends, we're coming to the end. So is my voice. <laughs> Uh, so I'm not going to speak for a long time, uh, but uh, you know I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, as I said this morning, we had the ambition that when people left this afternoon, they were going to be inspired. And at least I have been inspired during the day. Uh, Listen to so many fantastic speakers but also having the chance to speak to many of you uh, in the room. So thank you for that. Uh, we had the ambition that we were going to learn. At least, again, I have learned a lot. Uh, statistics, facts, uh, but also a lot of learning by listening to the speakers on the best practices, what they have done in Yara, what they have done in Startoil, what have they have done in Google, all of these businesses. And, and that's key because there's a lot of good things happening. And sometimes we're not aware. And we need to learn from each other and uh, be inspired uh, by that. And then the last uh, ambition was uh, that we were going to build new and strong connections. And we've been talking about, I can't remember who mentioned it, that you need to, you know, give out your business cards. Uh, and I don't know if you've had the chance to speak, to, to get to know each other, but now when we uh, leave this room, there's a light lunch outside, so you still have time to get out your business cards and to, to talk and to interact uh, on uh, that. As of care, uh, we will follow up. We had a new connections uh, last year. That was a success, but this has been an even bigger success. Uh, and we're going to have a new connections also next uh, year with a new topic. But uh, between uh, now and then, we would love to interact with you. Um, we will reach out to you. You know, we have uh, your contact information since you've registered on our website. So we will reach out to you because we want to continue the conversation, but not only the conversation. We want to continue, you know, making progress, uh, acting, because there are so many things we already can act uh, on. So uh, if you get an email from us, uh, if you get a telephone uh, call, you know, please pick it up, please uh, answer. Then uh, some thanks. This conference would have not have been the same if it hadn't been for Nordfund and NHU wanting to do this together with uh, us. So thank you so much to NHU and to, to Nordfund. 
we wouldn't have been able to have this conference uh, without the financial support uh, from NORAD and also from the US Embassy. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, it wouldn't have been a success without the fantastic speakers. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, coming to Norway because some of you have traveled uh, from far and uh, also to uh, the Norwegian speakers that decided to come to the conference. Thank you so um, much. Uh, Mark, uh, Edo, um, you moderated the last uh, New Connections. You moderated this one. We have already booked you in for November next year. <laughs> uh, so so uh, you just, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I told you you're a huge friend of CARE uh, and uh, you know you continue to support us uh, every time we contact you so thank you so much and for the work that you have done. In the end... <laughs> this conference wouldn't have been a conference uh, without a fantastic man. And he's standing there and his name is Anders and he works in CARE. Because it's not true what Mark said, that I have been the one working the most in the care office when it comes to this uh, conference. It was Anders. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Anders and the team of Care in Norway. So now, you know, this is just a start. Let's continue uh, the conversation. Let's uh, make sure that we act on everything we have talked of today. I can't say anymore. <laughs> thank you all for coming and have lunch.